Hello, and welcome to the seventh episode of Among the Ancients with Emily Wilson, a podcast series from the London Review of Books. I'm Thomas Jones, an editor at the LRB. Emily Wilson is Professor of Classical Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Hello, Emily, and thank you for joining me. Thank you for being here. So after six episodes on ancient Greek poets and dramatists, we're moving west now to Rome and skipping forward a few centuries. The first of the six Latin poets we're going to discuss in the second half of this series is Catullus, who lived from the mid-80s to the mid-50s BC in the last decades, or the death throes, I suppose you could say, of the Roman Republic. He was born in what's now Verona, around the same time as Brutus and Mark Antony, but died younger than them, around the time that Julius Caesar was invading Britain. So there were earlier Latin poets than Catullus, of course. Livius Andronicus, who's often called the father of Latin poetry, who translated the Odyssey into Latin in the 3rd century BC. Ennius, who lived around 200 BC and wrote the Annales, an, an epic history of Rome and the second century playwrights Plautus and Terence. Did Catullus look to those earlier Latin poets as models for his own writing? To a certain extent, he certainly did. I mean, I think we can see in Catullus's poetic performance of a comic obscenity and aggression. That's a big theme in Roman comedy. And also the central theme in the love poetry of Catullus of evoking the mixed, complicated emotions of an elite young man who's pining for an inaccessible female love object. The plot of most of Roman comedy is some version of that. So Catullus is certainly drawing on the tropes of Roman comedy, but at the same time he's doing a very different kind of poetry from the theatrical poetry of Plautus and Terence, and drawing also on Greek models as they did too, and different Greek models from those of the dramatists. Right, so who were the Greeks that he that he looked to? He looked to a whole range of different Greek literary models, but one whole school that we should certainly emphasize is the Hellenistic poets who were, who were writing in and around the Library of Alexandria in Egypt in the 3rd and 2nd centuries BCE. So Callimachus is one of the central figures there, along with Theocritus. And Callimachus's very explicit poetics, which, um, as we can tell from the beginning of the mostly lost poem, the Aitia, he emphasizes a learned and knowing kind of poetry in which you're alluding to a very long tradition of earlier literature that the reader is supposed to know, where there's a lot of puns, there are a lot of in-jokes, there's a focus on not going on and on and on in a boring way, but being as original and, and witty as possible. And the sort of jokiness about Hellenistic poetry and a clever, cleverness, even clever cleverness, which is really important in Catullus as well as in the Hellenistics. And I think also maybe it's worth emphasizing that, as you said, Catullus was writing in what you could say is the death throes of the Republic, but also in the period of Roman expansion across the Mediterranean world. The Hellenistics were writing in a period of um, of Macedonian expansion across the world and in a, in a context where they were Greek writers writing alongside an Egyptian um, court. So an awareness of multiculturalism, globalism of a whole world, as well as an awareness of a long literary poetic tradition, I think is there in both periods. And Catullus is very much conscious of being a poet of proto-empire, just as Callimachus was. And Cicero, the orator, statesman, lawyer, letter writer, referred to to, to Catullus and his friends as the neoterics. What did that name mean? Did he mean it as a compliment? He he didn't mean it very nice, probably. Um, uh, Cicero had a whole political feud with with the brother of the the woman whom Catullus probably had a long-standing adulterous affair with. We'll get into that in a few minutes. Catullus and his and his circle of literary friends were very self-consciously marketing a new kind of poetry, a technically virtu- virtuosic kind of poetry, which is displaying its newness all the time. And that's part of what it means to be ne- to be a neoteric poet or to be a lepidus poet, is to have a technical virtuosity and a coolness, which is not associated with the, the old work of Ennius. Right, and so the, the, like the, the neoterics, it's like new kids on the block or something. That word lepidus that you, you just used... That, um, in, in the first poem, the dedication, Catullus uses that to describe, and he uses it quite a lot, actually, doesn't he, as a, as a 
as a word of praise or something that he's trying to do that is witty, charming, elegant. But it did, it has it has a, some pejorative implications as well, but not as used by him. But it sort of some some people used it to imply. I mean, we'll get onto the question of gender later, but weakness, effeminacy, these sort of from a certain point of view, these un-Roman, it was a sort of an un-Roman characteristic. Right. So I think one of the things that's so interesting about Catullus in general, including about his aesthetics, is the way that he is constantly skirting or jumping across these boundaries of, of gender as well as of aesthetics, where he's both asserting, I'm the most ultra-masculine poet you've ever read, but then also I'm going to be fancy and... Um, in certain ways, un-Roman. I'm going to be looking constantly to pre-Roman models in my constant citing of the Greeks. And I'm going to be ultra-polished and not rough, rude, authentic, traditional in the way that the previous generation of Roman poets might have been. So it's a way of sort of asserting this inhabiting of a complicated boundary between am I really masculine or am I, am I actually in some way both un-Roman and unmasculine? So the, the 116 more or less intact, mostly short poems by Catullus that we have, they survived to a tenuous line of manuscript transmission, right? The copies of lost copies of lost copies until the 14th century when they started to be copied more widely and then they were first printed in 1472 along with the poems of Propertius and Tibullus, is that right? The slightly mm-hmm. later poets. And they're arranged in this, they're arranged according to metre, We'll talk a bit later. You've already mentioned it. We'll talk more later about Catullus's remarkable technical range. Though we don't know who uh, who assembled and organised them. And as already mentioned, that the first poem is a dedication. It's dedication this little book, a libellus, um, to Cornelius Nepos, who is a friend of Cicero's and possibly a patron or admirer of the Neoterics. But we don't know if that libellus meant all hundred poems and more that we have, or just some of them. So that's one of the you know the many things that we don't know. And how are they arranged? Are they arranged thematically? Do they tell a story? What's the theory behind the way they're presented to us? They're arranged sort of by form in that we have a sequence of shorter poems and there are clusters that come together. So then we have the longer poems are all clustered together and then the very short epigrammatic poems come at the end. Um, as you say, it's really unclear who put this this collection together in this order. Libellus is the diminutive of the word liber, meaning book. The complete works of Catullus, as we have them, are about th- are three books worth. So surely you, you would think that if you're introducing a three bo- three volume set, you wouldn't call it a libellus. But there are lots of different scholarly theories about who exactly, when exactly, how exactly were these poems put together in this order. The Hellenistic poets were very much interested in the ordering of books and book order as a way to create meaning. And you might think it would be unlikely that Catullus wouldn't have thought about how to order his poems. But there's really, I think, no way to tell to what extent was the order we have in any way authorised or was it nothing to do with what Catullus wanted. And there are ways that, I mean, not entirely, obviously, but to some extent... If certain meters are used for certain themes, arranging them metrically means you do get poems of, on similar subjects grouped together. But it isn't exactly his that the the story of the love affair. It doesn't go chronologically through that. But if we turn to those love poems, if we can call them love poems, first and have a reading of poem eight, which describes or dramatizes a relationship that's ending or has just ended. Um, And this translation is by Peter Green. Wretched Catullus, stop this tomfool stuff, and what you see has perished, treat as lost for good. Time was, every day for you, the sun shone bright, when you scurried off wherever she led you, the girl you loved as no one shall again be loved. There, Where so many charming pleasures all went on, things that you wanted, things she didn't quite turn down, then for you truly every day the sun shone bright. Now she said no. So you too, feeble wretch, say no. Don't chase reluctance. Don't embrace a sad sack life. Make up your mind. Be stubborn, obdurate, hang tough. 
So goodbye, sweetheart. Now Catullus will hang tough. Won't ask, where is she? Won't, since you've said no. Beg, plead. You'll soon be sorry when you get these pleas no more. Bitch, wicked bitch, poor wretch. What life awaits you now? Who'll now pursue you, still admire you for your looks? Whom will you love now? Who will ever call you theirs? Who'll get your kisses? Whose lips will you bite in play? You, though, Catullus, keep your mind made up. Hang tough. Thanks for listening to this extract from Among the Ancients, a close reading series from the London Review of Books. To listen to the full episodes and all our other close reading series, sign up to our close reading subscription. Go to lrb.me forward slash close readings or click on the link in the description.